amen and good morning, East Point. It's good to be here with you today, and I am excited uh, about the opportunity to share with you from God's Word today as we continue in our series, Summer in the Psalms. We've been uh, six weeks in this, uh, in this series. This is week seven, uh, and so today we'll be looking at Psalm chapter seven, and so I want to invite you to go ahead and turn there with me now. Last week, if you were with us, we saw in Psalm chapter 6, David uh, writing from a place of sorrow, but ending that psalm with joy. And so we're going to see uh, a similar progression today in this psalm, but uh, for some different reasons that we'll kind of talk through as we, as we walk through this. And so uh, before we dive into the actual text of the psalm this morning, I do want to show you uh, one thing, point out something from the title of this psalm, if you look in your Bible just above verse 1, uh, you should see this little subscript. It says, a Shigion of David. And that word Shigion there is, is a word that scholars are kind of unsure of what that word actually means. Probably a musical term of some sort. Uh, but it goes on to say uh, that David sang this psalm to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjaminite. Now, there's a little more uncertainty here uh, because we don't know exactly who Cush the Benjaminite was. And scholars have different ideas about who this was. Was it an actual man named Cush? Was it uh, a code word? Some scholars believe that, that uh, David may actually have been referring to King Saul uh, using this word. We, we just don't know exactly who it was, but we do know that it was someone from the tribe of Benjamin. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, King Saul, David's predecessor, was from the tribe of Benjamin. And when Saul died in battle with the Philistines, that's when David became king. Now, David, of course, was not from the tribe of Benjamin. He was not a descendant of Saul. And so because of that, there was a, a great deal of hostility that David endured coming from the tribe of Benjamin. As a matter of fact, we see some of this in 2 Samuel chapter 16, as David has been forced to flee Jerusalem, the capital city, because of his son Absalom's rebellion. And as he is passing through one town, fleeing from Jerusalem, uh, the Bible tells us there's a man named Shimei. Shimei was a, a Benjaminite. He comes out as David is passing through and he begins to insult David, he begins to curse David. 2 Samuel 16, verse 7 says, And Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you man of blood, you worthless man. The Lord has avenged on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. See, your evil is on you, for you are a man of blood. So we read that, we hopefully remember from Old Testament history that David had not taken the throne from Saul. Saul had lost the throne because of his own sin and God had taken the throne from Saul and God had given it to David. As a matter of fact, you should remember David had multiple opportunities to kill King Saul. And he didn't take those opportunities. He said he would not raise his hand against God's anointed king. Yet here we see in this psalm today, David dealing with some false accusations from this man Cush or whoever this is from the tribe of Benjamin from Saul's family. And while we don't know the immediate events, the immediate uh, context that inspired this particular song, we know that David over really the course of his life, dealt with a lot of hostility from this particular tribe. And so as we walk through Psalm 7 this morning, the title, if you're taking notes, of the sermon is simply Trusting God. Trusting God. And we're going to see David as he is dealing with these false accusations from the tribe of Benjamin, that he is still able to trust God and to worship God. And so if you have found your place in Psalm chapter 7, I do want to invite you this morning to stand with me if you are physically able in honor and reverence to the reading of God's holy, inerrant, life-giving word. 
Beginning in verse 1, David writes, O Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. Arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it return on high. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. O let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous, you who test the minds and hearts, O righteous God. My shield is with God, who saves the upright in heart. God is a righteous judge, a God who feels indignation every day. If a man does not repent, God will wet his sword and he has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit, digging it out, and falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, and on his own skull his violence descends. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we come before you now as we stand with our Bibles open before you. God, I pray that as we take just a few minutes and walk through this psalm together, God, I pray that you would reveal the truth of your words to our hearts today. God, that you would draw us to yourself. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Once again, if you are taking notes this morning, the title was Trusting God. The main lesson or the main idea that we're going to see as we walk through this is that we can trust God in difficult times knowing that he is still in control. We can trust God in difficult times knowing that he is still in control. David, in this psalm, dealing with with some sort of false accusations, and we'll get a better idea of what those accusations were as we walk through this. But yet David still knows that he can trust God with his Problems. And I want to show you from this psalm four ways that we can trust God in difficulties. And the first way is to expect unjust suffering. Expect unjust suffering. David is dealing with slander from within his own nation. He is being wrongfully accused of injustice something that would be very unfitting for a king, someone in his position. And the reality is for all of us is that at some point in our lives, if we are faithfully living out the gospel, if we are faithfully living out the life that God has called us to live, we will face unjust suffering of some kind. We shouldn't be caught off guard by that. And the reason we shouldn't be caught off guard by that is because the Bible tells us that over and over. And we tend to think sometimes that that if we just do the best that we can, we go to church on Sundays, we read our Bibles when we can, that that God is somehow obligated to us, that God uh, is, is obligated to spare us of suffering. And that while bad things happen to other people, surely not to us. But you see, that just kind of demonstrates that A lot of times we're more impacted by society and culture than we are by the word of God. Alistair Begg, who is a pastor up in Cleveland, Ohio, I feel like I I quote him every time I preach, but he's he's such a phenomenal expositor of God's word. He said uh, of Christians being caught off guard by suffering, he said the reason is because we have baptized into orthodoxy the notion that freedom is our right, that peace is our right, is our right, and that justice is our right. And he went on to say that while those are good things, and those are things that we should be thankful for, that those are not 
the pattern that we see in Scripture. That is not the pattern that we see even as we study church history. Bad things happen to good people. Suffering comes in the lives of believers. And sometimes we take promises of Scripture and we remove them from their context. And so we take a verse like, like Jeremiah 29, 11, a verse that many of us probably memorized as young children, a verse that we, we tend to throw at young people as they're graduating high school, going off to college, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to, to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. And that's a great verse. It's a great promise to claim. But if we divorce that statement from its context, then we don't really understand that promise. Because inevitably, at some point in our life, suffering is going to come. And if all we know is that one statement, then we look at it and we say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody told me that, that God's plan was to prosper me, not to harm me. And now here I am, I'm being harmed. God must have lied to me. God's word must not be true after all. But you see, when we understand what Jeremiah 29 is really all about, right before God made that statement to his people, he told them, you're about to go into exile in a foreign land. You're about to be conquered by the country of Babylon, you're gonna be carried off into exile and you're gonna spend 70 years as prisoners in a foreign land. And he said, go ahead and build houses there, plant gardens there, pray for the welfare of that nation because in its welfare will be your welfare. And before the nation of Israel could protest and say, wait a minute, God, wait a minute, that can't be right. We're your chosen people. We're your special possession. You can't let this happen to us. God says, I know the plans that I have for you to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. You may not know the, the plans I have for you, but I do. And when we understand that context, when we walk through those difficult times in life, we don't look at it and say, well, God promised to, to spare me of suffering. We can look at that and say, you know what? I don't know God's plan for me, but God knows. God knows the plan he has for me. The promise is not that we don't go through suffering in this life. The promise is that we can trust God in the midst of that suffering. See, last week we saw David experiencing some difficulties that were mostly caused by God's discipline in his life. They were mostly brought on David by his own doing. But this week, which by the way, that happens to us as well, as children of God. But this week, we see David here in Psalm 7 suffering through really no fault of his own. And so I want you to see a couple of things here about unjust suffering in the life of a believer. And the first thing is that God is our refuge. David says that at the very beginning of this Psalm. He says, oh Lord my God, in you do I take refuge. And that's a common theme all throughout the book of Psalms. God is our refuge. Now, our first reaction to suffering a lot of times is to, is to try to fix it ourselves, to try to figure out what's the cause of this, let me correct that, and let me get through this. And David had the ability to do that. He was the most powerful man in the nation of Israel. As a matter of fact, back in 2 Samuel 16, as this man Shimei comes out and the Bible says he's throwing rocks at David as David passes through and he's shouting these curses at David. One of David's servants looks at him and says, and I'm paraphrasing here, you mean to go kill that guy? Who does this guy think he is talking to you like that? You mean to go take care of him? And David in that moment said, no. And he went on to say, you know, it may be that God told him to curse me. So leave him alone. See, David recognized that even in that moment, the only place he could take refuge, not in his own ability, not in his own strength as the king, but in God and God alone. 
I remember about two years ago, two and a half years ago now, January of 2020, about two months before the world completely flipped upside down. Many of you will remember we had uh, two tornadoes that came through DeSoto County and one came right through this area. And we were in the process of building this building. It was, we, we hadn't moved in yet, but um, that tornado, one was just south of Hernando, one came through here. Uh, many of you remember that, I'm sure. But if you look, go back and look at like the weather service track of that tornado, uh, the very beginning of it, where it started, pretty much right in my backyard. And while we were fortunate, uh, we didn't have a lot of damage, uh, I do remember that morning. It was about 5.30 on a Saturday. And I was doing what any normal person would be doing at 5.30 on a Saturday morning in January. I was fast asleep. And I remember my phone starts going off. Amy's phone starts going off. And this wasn't like the little weather, the weather app notification. This was the same notification, you know, when there's an Amber Alert in the store and everybody's phone starts going crazy. That's what it was. And we woke up and we just immediately jumped up, went to the back of the house, got the kids out of the bed, drugged them out in the closet. And I remember getting in that closet. And as soon as I shut the door to that closet, the lights went out. And as soon as the lights went out, I could hear the wind blowing outside. I could hear things hitting the side of the house. I could hear things hitting the top of the house. And I just remember looking at Amy like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. And we, didn't even, we weren't even in like the direct hit of the tornado. I can't imagine what that would be. Some of you, I'm sure, have experienced that before. But in that moment, all we could do was just take refuge in that closet and just kind of hope for the best. And in a much, much greater sense, in those difficult times in life, God is our refuge and he is a refuge that we can trust. See, our confidence in difficult times doesn't come from our ability to overcome or to endure. Our confidence is found in the very nature and character of God as our refuge. There's another thing here about suffering that I want you to see. And that is that our enemy desires our destruction. Look back at the end of verse one. David says, save me from all my pursuers and deliver me. Lest like a lion, they tear my soul apart, rending it in pieces with none to deliver. This isn't David being paranoid. David has real enemies and they desire his destruction. And I can't read verse 2 of Psalm 7 without thinking about 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, where Peter warns us to, to be sober-minded, to be watchful, because our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. See, we don't have to go through life seeking out sin or seeking out suffering. It's actively pursuing us. We have an enemy. He is bent on our destruction. David calls out for deliverance. He says, lest my enemies tear my soul to pieces. In the end of verse two, he says, with none to deliver. See, David recognizes that God is his only hope. And the same is true for us today. Because the reality is this, if God doesn't save us, we won't be saved. If God doesn't heal us, we won't be healed. If God doesn't provide that job for us, we won't have a job. And you can fill in the blank with whatever you want. If God does not deliver us, we won't be delivered. See, we face an enemy that we cannot defeat an enemy that is actively pursuing after us. But the last thing about suffering that we see in this section is that we can take our problems to God. We can take our problems to God. Look at verse four, or let's look at verse three. David says, O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there is wrong in my hands, if I have repaid my friend with evil or plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him trample my life to the ground and lay my glory in the dust. 
And so we finally get an idea here of what David is actually being accused of. He's being accused of repaying a friend with evil, of plundering his enemy without cause. And David just comes before God. He lays that at his feet and he makes a pretty bold claim. He says, if I'm guilty of what they're saying, let them have me. They want to rend my soul to pieces, God. If I've done this, let them have me. This is a picture of a man who is at the end of himself. He realizes that he cannot carry this burden alone, so he, he just gives it to God. Back in 1 Peter, which is a book that, a letter that deals a good bit with, with suffering, with unjust suffering in the life of a believer. In 1 Peter 2, 21, Peter says about suffering in the life of a believer. He says, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. See, as believers, we can expect unjust suffering. Why? Because it's our calling. It's our calling. It's, what, it's the example that Jesus gave to us. But even in the midst of that, we can trust God knowing that he is in control. We don't allow suffering to, to push us away from God. We allow it to draw us closer to him. As we move on, the second thing I want you to see here about trusting God in difficulties is to surrender to God completely. Surrender to God completely. David goes on in verse six. He says, arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me, for you have appointed a judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. David is relying completely on God for vengeance. And he's giving us here the picture of a courtroom where he is literally calling God to come in to this courtroom to preside as judge in his anger. He says, arise, O Lord, in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. But he makes a pretty incredible statement in verse eight. The Lord judges the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to the integrity that is in me. David says, judge my enemies, God, but judge me too. And he says, judge me according to my righteousness and the integrity that is in me. And we may read that and we may think, oh, slow down, David. Hang on just a second. You're not righteous. You didn't live in integrity. You were an adulterer, a murderer. You fell over and over again. So how could David make this claim? Well, first of all, I think it's important for us to distinguish here. David is not claiming to be perfect. David is not claiming uh, that he has never sinned. What David is saying to God is, I am innocent of the charge made against me in verse four. I haven't repaid my friend with evil. I haven't plundered my enemy without cause. And back in verse five, David said, if I have done this, let my enemies have me. And now essentially in verse eight, he is saying, if I have done this, God, then you judge me. He completely surrenders that problem to God, trusting that God will vindicate him. I think it's also important to note here that David, in this moment, is not willing to point out the sin in other people's lives while ignoring the sin in his own life. That's a pretty difficult concept a lot of times for us to live out because it's so easy for us to look at the world around us. And we live, let's be real, in a pretty dark, corrupt, perverse society that seems to grow darker and darker by the day. It's easy to ask, God, when? When are you gonna judge all of this sin? But how often do we, do we pray to God and say, God, judge, judge the sin around us, but God, judge us as well. Church, we have to be careful that we're not 
bothered by sin all around us while tolerating sin in our own lives. David in this moment is is willing to say, judge my enemies, but judge me as well. But there's another thing we see here as we look about, talk about surrendering to God in verse 9. David says, let the evil of the wicked come to an end and may you establish the righteous. You see, David's desire is not simply to see his enemies defeated. David doesn't come to God and say, God, they've lied about me. They've mistreated me. They've slandered me. Now go get them, God. He says, let the evil come to an end and you establish the righteous. David's desire here is not simply for the defeat of evil, but for the triumph of righteousness. Last week, we saw David asking God to save him for the sake of his steadfast love. Now we see David uh, desiring evil be defeated so that God would establish his righteousness. In verse 10, David says, my shield is with God who saves the upright in heart. See, God is our shield. God is the one that we can trust to judge our enemies. God is the one we can trust to defeat evil. God is the one we can trust to establish righteousness. And we can trust him by surrendering our problems completely to him. So the question for us today What is it that we are are carrying around? What burden have you brought into this place this morning? We've all come in here today. We've all brought different burdens in with us today. What the Bible teaches us is we don't have to carry those burdens alone. David's being persecuted by his enemies. His life is literally in danger. But he takes that burden to God. He lays it at his feet and he says, here it is, God. You take it, you do with it whatever you will. And as we go on through this psalm, we see a third thing about trusting God. And that is to rest in God's judgment. Rest in God's judgment. Now, you may hear that phrase and you may think, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound right. How can we rest in God's judgment? We'll look back at verse 11. First of all, David says God is a righteous judge. So how do we rest in God's judgment? Because we know that God is a righteous judge. He goes on in verse 11 and he says that he is a God who feels indignation every day. David is literally telling us here that God's anger burns against sinners Every single day. David is about to paint a picture of God for us that we generally don't like to think about. God's anger towards sinners burns every day. Charles Spurgeon said about God's anger towards sinners. He said, the best day that ever dawns for a sinner brings a curse with it. Sinners may have many feast days, but no safe days. The best day that ever dawns in the life of a sinner brings with it a curse. That's what David is telling us. That's not a very popular picture of God today. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that would hear that and they would say, well, if that's your God, I won't know part of it. But the reality is for us that if we, if we only preach God's love, If we preach a message that says, well, God's love is going to win out in the end and and everybody's just going to come into heaven. That's a half gospel. But the other side of that is that if we only preach God's wrath towards sin, but we don't preach the love and the grace and the mercy of God, that is a half gospel as well. And a half gospel is a false gospel. Now, David is going to give us a little more description here of of, uh, God's judgment. Let's look at verse 12. He says, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. 
Now we read that. And you may think, how can we rest in that? How can we rest in God's judgment knowing that he is angry towards sinners every day, knowing that he is, he is literally sharpening his sword, he is readying his bow with fiery arrows? Did you notice what David said at the beginning of verse 12? He says, if a man does not repent, God will do this. You see, even in one of the most descriptive pictures of God's judgment anywhere in Scripture, we see that God has made a way out for us. He's made a way out. And that way out is through the cross of Jesus. There's a song that we sing here often at East Point, And part of those lyrics say this. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. See, the reality, church, is that God does not excuse sin. God does not overlook sin. God does not tolerate sin. There are no scales in heaven where we have to simply kind of balance out our good works and our bad works. And if our good works somehow outweigh our bad works, then God lets us in. That's not how it works. You see, there is our sin and there is God's wrath and we all stand guilty before God. But there's also the cross of Jesus. And Jesus came to this earth, God in the flesh. He lived a perfect life, kept God's law in its entirety and then he went to the cross and he took God's wrath on himself. Jesus took those fiery arrows that were pointed at you and pointed at me. That's the good news of the gospel. That God looks at him and he pardons us. We don't have to take those fiery arrows of God's wrath because as David said in verse 10, God is our shield. But you see, the reality is if we don't understand God's wrath, if we don't understand the extent of God's hatred of sin, the cross doesn't really matter to us. Back in verse 14, David says, Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. Now, if that's not a picture of our society today, I don't know what is. Conceiving evil pregnant with mischief, giving birth to lies. He goes on in verse 15 and says, he makes a pit, digging it out. He falls into the hole that he has made. He's painting us a picture here of a sinner who, who is building a trap for others, but in the end, falls into the pit that he's dug for others. And then in verse 16, his mischief returns upon his own head. On his own skull, his violence descends. You know, it often feels like evil is winning. The wicked seem to prosper while God's people are suffering. But David here reminds us that, that that's not the case. The sinner who does not repent will be consumed by his own sin as God's judgment is poured out. But for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, in his death and in his resurrection, we can rest in God's judgment, knowing that he has delivered us. And church, that is our motivation to take the good news of the gospel outside the doors of this church to those people who live next door, who work across the, across the hall. Because apart from Christ, they will endure God's wrath. There's the last thing we see here at the end of this psalm, if we're gonna trust God. And that is that we worship God faithfully. David ends this psalm in verse 17. He says, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. I love the process that we see in this psalm, very similar to what we saw last week. David beginning the psalm, crying out for deliverance, 
being pursued by enemies that he believes are, are going to kill him. They're going to, to literally tear him to shreds. But as he thinks about God's goodness, he thinks about God's mercy, about God's faithfulness and his justice, he goes from fearing for his life to giving thanks and praising God. Now, how was he able to do that? It's not because God had delivered David. There's nothing here to indicate that God had delivered him. It wasn't because David's name had been cleared of these false charges because nothing indicates here that his name has actually been cleared. So what was it? Notice what he says in verse 17. I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness. David was able to simply find comfort in who God is. The very nature and character of God. His praise and his thanks is not based on his circumstances, not based on what's happening around him. It's based simply on who God is. We see the same thing happen in Acts chapter 16. You remember the story of Paul and Silas. As they're traveling around, they meet this, this young lady who the Bible says uh, has an evil spirit. Her masters are using her to make a lot of money, telling fortunes for people. Paul is able to cast that demon out of this young girl. And as her masters see that they've lost their opportunity to make a lot of money, they drag Paul and Silas into the city. They cause an uproar. They beat them and they throw them in prison. But in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we find Paul and Silas sitting in a prison cell. And the Bible says at midnight, they begin singing and praising God. Now, how could they do that? How could they do that sitting in a prison cell? They've just been beaten by a mob. It wasn't because God had delivered them from prison. They're still sitting in prison. It was because they understood that God is worthy of our worship, regardless of our circumstances. It's the same thing David shows us here in Psalm 7. We don't praise God for what he does. We praise God for who he is. And John Allen said it just a couple of weeks ago. You're either coming out of a storm, in the middle of a storm, or you're headed into one. And that's just kind of the way that it goes. And the reality for us is if we can't praise God in the midst of the storm, I'm not sure that we can praise him when everything's going our way. Don't allow your worship of God to be dependent on your circumstances. Yes, we pray and we ask God to deliver us. We see David doing that here. But our praise and our worship is not based on whether God delivers us, but it's based on who God is. As we close out this psalm this morning, I've got just a couple of points of application for you. How do we take the truth of this psalm and live it out? Number one, I want to encourage you to allow times of suffering to draw you closer to God. A lot of times we see people experience difficulty and they walk away from the church. They walk away from God. And their reasoning for that is because, well, God let me down. God let me down. And, and what that really shows us is that they, they don't understand what the Bible teaches. Because the Bible tells us that we will go through difficult times. And there are many of you sitting here today, you can testify to that. And if you haven't experienced those yet, Get ready. But I want to encourage you to allow those difficulties not to push you away from God, but to draw you closer to him. And number two, I want to encourage you to remind yourself daily of God's faithfulness. Remind yourself daily of God's faithfulness. David gives us a great example of that in this psalm. He begins crying out for deliverance. And then he just kind of walks himself back through the nature and the character of God. And as he thinks about that and meditates on that, he is able to end praising God and giving thanks for who he is. And we all need that reminder every single day so that when those difficult times come, we're able to respond the way that David did.
We're going to have a time of response like we do every week. Matt's going to lead us in that. If you're here this morning and you have never placed your faith in Jesus as your Savior, we just saw an incredible picture of God's wrath this morning. And what you need to know is that apart from Jesus, God's wrath, God's anger burns against you every day. And you may not like that. You may have never heard that before, but that's what the Bible says. I didn't make it up. We just read it straight from God's word. But you also need to know that because of his love for you, Jesus has already taken that wrath on your behalf. The Bible says that if you call out to him in faith and repentance, he will save you. So as Matt leads us this morning, if that's you today, I want to encourage you just to come forward. I'll be here at the front. I would love to sit down and talk with you and show you what the Bible says it means to have a relationship with God through Christ. I'm going to pray for us. Matt's going to lead. You respond as you feel led today. Let's pray together. Father God, Lord, we come to you once again. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the truth of your word, the truth that we see in this psalm this morning. Uh, God, I pray that as we uh, just take a few minutes to reflect on that, God, that you will just continue to speak that truth into our hearts and into our minds, that we would respond the way you would have us to this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Stand with me.